The wind is stronger now. Our ice is thinner. The weather is getting warmer. We've all seen the images associated with climate change. The melting glaciers, the statistical tipping points, the floods, the surges. So how come we are not compelled or pushed, moved to do more to tackle that one single, perhaps greatest challenge of our time? As an anthropologist, I would suggest it's because we are missing the human face of climate change. You see, all the, all the technology, all our satellite imagery, the high-resolution telemetry images, all this is so recent when it comes to our history on this planet. You see, for the better part of humanity's story of adapting to our world, we have passed on our experiences by actually telling each other stories. So let me tell you a couple of stories about the human face of climate change. Our story is set in the Arctic, and the reason for that is, of course, because we know that the Arctic is considered the canary in humanity's coal mine. The changes that are coming and are happening will be first and foremost felt in the Arctic. And so this is a story about a very unique group of people that I had the extreme privilege of working alongside um, for the better part of a year. And it's a story about their relationship to the environment. So I lived in this place called Krakatasrak. It basically means the big island, all right? So it's on the west coast of Greenland, and you see, like everything else in the Arctic, it's big. In fact, Greenland is so big that if you were to stand in Thule and had to travel far, far to the southern part of Greenland, it's a distance somewhere between Rome and Johannesburg. It's massive. You see, for millennia, the Inuit have perfected or mastered the art of safely navigating in one of our planet's most hostile, inhospitable, rapidly changing environments. In fact, they have geared their entire way of life and their culture to this place. So I suspect they might have a story and a lesson for us to learn when it comes to dealing with climate change. The Inuit have a name for the ice. They call it Siku. In fact, it has more than a name, because they believe it to be endowed with a kind of spirit, an entity that has intention. And they call that Siku Inua. And they're always quick to make the association with another great entity that they call Sila. It's the sky spirit, the weather, personified in the wind. So the Inuit know that there's always a connection between the condition of the ice and the moods of Sila. And they can make that connection. They learn that very, very early on in life how different wind conditions are associated to the ice. They can travel the ice and read it, reading the weather. This is the alpha and omega to finding the food and thereby the life, creating a life in the Arctic environment. One of the, one of the earliest stories that I heard when I was traveling out one day with a good friend of mine is one that he told me that, you know, the wind 
is stronger now. And this, of course, affects the conditions of the ice, because when the ice tries to form, we need quiet winds. But when winds are blowing stronger and stronger, and fiercer and fiercer, it continues to break our ice. The wind is stronger now. There is another story that I would like to tell you. Not so much the wind being stronger, but while out traveling one day with a hunting friend, you know, he tells me, the ice back in the day used to be so much thicker. We used to have to cut stairs in that ice to get to the water where the life and the animals are, our food. Nowadays, we just poke it once or twice and we're at the water. So, if we listen to the stories of the old hunters, they tell us that, you know, back in the good old days, they always talk about the old days. They say, you know, the sea ice would, would come in late December and stay around until summer, maybe five or six months. Nowadays, it might only last a couple of months, one or two months, maybe a couple of weeks, one or two days. But, you know, despite this loss of that natural phenomenon upon which they have built their entire existence, the Inuit, with a, with a kind of usual pragmatic optimism, will always tell me that we've always lived here and will continue to live here. Late at night, when you've been listening to those many stories about traveling out in the ice, you always often hear them end on the saying that Sila is our master. In other words, nature carries on regardless. All we can do is to try and keep up. And it is in, in that trying to keep up that the Inuit are simply doing what they have always done, which is to maintain, you could say, this is the crudeness of English language, but a dialogue with our surroundings, with our environment, understanding the conditions, the connection between the weather and the ice to finally find out where those animals are. Early one morning, in the depth of the Arctic winter, I'm out crossing the ice, trying to keep up with a good friend of mine as we're walking out, and Siku is dead calm. And Sila is smiling from a sky above. When suddenly, my hunting companion turns around to me and says, you know, when I hear that sound of my own footsteps as I walk across the ice, it truly reminds me of who I am. What's the moral of these stories? I think when it comes to adaptation on the planet, our own survival, it's about taking a view not off the world like that big satellite out in space looking down, but within it, part and parcel to begin with. Through our experiences, dialogue, and the stories that we pass on. My last story tonight is, it's actually not from the Arctic, but it does have to do with ice. And it, it comes from a colleague of mine who works in the Andes, and, and he's telling me a story about how there's an indigenous group of people in the Andes now who are mourning the loss of their god. You see, they believe their god, a nearby glacier, to be their god. But that now, because of global warming, this god is dying, melting away very, very quickly. 
But you know, instead of mourning, these people have started to take ice from nearby glaciers, new ones, to carry them on these mountain roads to their dying God, placing them at the foot of it to re rekindle its life. So what's left? Well, maybe you can tell me. Did you hear the stories? Listen, yeah? Do you have a dialogue with your environment? And finally, how much ice would you be willing to carry? Thank you.